Lord be with you. A couple of things about the prayers. You're going to hear Lael Biela's name. Lael was put on hospice, so uh, we'll put her in the prayers. Uh, you also hear Bob Starr's name. Bob had a bad reaction to a bee sting, so we'll have him in our prayers. And uh, a former member, the mother of Jana Everett, Benita Cheryl Stamper, died yesterday evening. So you'll hear her name in our prayers. Our gospel text is the very familiar story of Mary and Martha a story that has some controversy. So we'll uh, see what that means for us. Let's prepare our hearts for worship through the brief order of confession and forgiveness on the third page of your bulletin. Please rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, abounding in steadfast love toward us, healing the sick and raising the dead, showering us with every good gift. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Just and gracious God, we come to you for healing in life. Our sins hurt others and diminish us. We confess them to you. Our lives bear the scars of sin. We bring these also to you. Show us your mercy, O God. Bind up our wounds. Forgive us our sins and free us to love. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Apostle Paul assures us, when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ, nailing the record of our sin to the cross. Jesus says to you, your sins are forgiven. Be at peace and tell everyone how much God has done for you. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Share God's peace by greeting those around you.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer the, hear their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Eternal God, you draw near to us in Christ, and you make yourself our guest amid the cares of our lives. Make us attentive to your presence, that we may treasure your word above all else. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
shall wear the starry crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, fathers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, fathers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, mothers, let's go down, come on down, don't you want to go down? Come on, mothers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sinners, let's go down, let's go A reading from Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant, who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season and your wife Sarah shall have a son. The word of the Lord. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle, who may abide upon your holy hill. They do not slander with the tongue, they do no evil to their friends. They do not cast discredit upon a neighbor. They do not give their money in hope of gain, nor do they take bribes against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be overthrown. The second lesson is from Colossians. 
Christ Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all thing, things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of, the, of his cross. And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you have heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter. Now as Jesus and his disciples went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Martha, Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the children to come forward. Anyone know what that is? Uh, Carter, very good. It's a paper clip. It clips onto paper like that, and it holds things. All right. By the way, we're going to talk about Mary and Martha <laughs> eventually. This is a paper clip. This very same paper clip is there. I just bent it out. It looks like a six, doesn't it? Or if you go like that, it looks like a nine. Or it might even look like a G. Okay, I'm gonna to try to balance it on my finger. Oh, didn't work. Should I try it again? <laughs> Who said no? Just for that, I'm gonna try it again. Oh, won't work. Okay, here's where the magic comes in. Anybody know what this is? Yeah, it's a cowbell. Very good, Emerson. 
I just needed a weight. Because watch this. Now, do you think I can balance it on my finger? <laughs> Zach says, yeah. Emerson says, no, we'll see. Wow, we. Isn't that something? That's not magic? You know what? You're right. The weight, the extra weight on it, makes it so you're able to balance. And that's pretty good. All right? Well, we had the story of Martha and Mary in our gospel lesson today. Mary sat at Jesus' feet, just like you're sitting there, to learn something from Jesus. And Martha was busy. She was busy trying to make sure they had a meal ready for Jesus and his disciples. Martha was doing good things. But what Jesus was trying to tell her is, Martha, you don't have balance in your life. You need to do what Mary does also. And then, with the balance... You can carry a heavy load, even a cow cowbell on a paper clip. Okay? Let's have a prayer. Repeat after me. Gracious God, we thank you for Martha and the good work she does. We thank you for Mary who is getting her priorities straight. We thank you for Jesus, who holds our lives together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, you can go back to your seats. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Mary welcomed Jesus, Martha welcomed Jesus into her home. Very often we think of this as Mary versus Martha, but truly it's Mary and Martha finding a balance. Here's Ted and Rick. Ted says to Rick, or he's holding up a sign, slackers for Jesus. And Ted goes, what? Excuse me, Rick goes, what? And Rick says, Mary's not a slacker. She's taking the time to keep her priorities straight. Whatever, I'm counting on both of those things looking alike. And then Rick goes, okay, but a real slacker wouldn't bother to make a sign. I've had people over the years, usually women, usually women who are hard workers in the church, say, why is that story in the Bible? Why did Jesus teach that story? Often they were women who also had children at home that they didn't think were doing their share around the house. Why is that story in the Bible? It's not an either or. It's an and. 
we do live in a very busy world. Uh, notice Jesus rebukes Martha, and is really rather harsh. Put down the vacuum sweeper and come and listen. He's really rather harsh. You are distracted and anxious by many things. Mary has chosen the better part. Uh, let's take a quick look at uh, ancient life. Hospitality was extremely important. People were to show hospitality. When people came to visit, they often had a very strenuous uh, travel time. They were hungry, most importantly, very thirsty. Every town had a square. And if people could not accommodate people in their homes, they could set up camp. Travelers could set up camp in the square. Townspeople would bring food for their livestock, would bring water for their livestock and for the people often brought them meals, but that town square was to show hospitality. I don't know if I've ever said this, but once when we were traveling, my parents bought a travel trailer. And we were traveling, and it was getting late at night. Something happened during the day, so we couldn't get to our destination, a uh, RV um, camp. And my father was just too tired. He couldn't go any further. So I drove into this little town, parked this camper next to the city square, and we spent the night there. And I remember my mother going, George, we can't do this. And my father goes, that's why they have a town square. I've never heard of that before, but we had a safe night there. Martha was doing what she was supposed to do, showing hospitality. Very often, people's lives depended upon the hospitality that others showed. That's why the Old Testament even extends that hospitality to strangers. They can't survive without, they may not be able to survive without your hospitality. So Martha is doing what she's supposed to do, showing hospitality. Let's take a quick look, though, uh, at, about our world. Somehow, we have gotten the idea that what life is about is merely about helping others. My, I'm better than you because I help more. I volunteer more. My church is better than your church because we're doing more. I remember uh, when we were having the Holland Book Fair, a member of James River, I probably should have mentioned that name, came by and thanked us for doing that for them. And I'm going, what? Somehow, this woman in her mind couldn't see a church doing s something good without somehow having it under the umbrella of her church. My church is better than your church because we do more. That's the kind of busy, anxious behavior that Jesus was condemning in Martha. My organization is better than your church. Look at all we're doing. Comes to the point even, I'm not here to learn about Jesus. I'm here to volunteer. Rodney Stark, in his book, The Triumph of Faith, Rodney Stark is a professor at uh, Baylor University down in Texas, and he has taken the statistics from all around the world, all the surveys they've taken all around the world, and he says faith 
is not decreasing, but faith is increasing. Christianity is not decreasing. Christianity is increasing. It's growing faster than any other religion. It's larger than any other religion. Rodney Stark says it's a myth to think that atheism is growing. He said worldwide, atheism is not growing, has not grown at all. An interesting uh, fact, he talks about uh, South America. South America, we have thought for decades that it was always a Roman Catholic nation, uh, continent. R Roman Catholics were the norm in, in South America. He said it wasn't always true. There may have been 10%, maybe 15% of the people were Roman Catholic. There were so few Roman Catholics, they couldn't get enough men to go into the ministry to have indigenous priests. They had to come from Europe or the United States. He said, and then something happened. The Protestants showed up, and the Protestants started preaching, of all things, faith. They started growing like gangbusters. It was mainly Pentecostals. It scared the Roman Catholic Church, and then of all things, they started preaching faith. And all of a sudden, the Roman Catholic Church grew like gangbusters. 40% Protestant, over 53% Roman Catholic. Faith is growing. It's been said by atheists in particular that we need to eliminate churches because churches teach superstition. The opposite happens to be true. Those countries that were once quite religious, where worship attendance has decreased, belief in what we call superstition has increased. Let me give you an example. I'll give you a couple of examples. France, two out of five people go to church. That's way down from what it had been. Two out of five go to church on any regular basis. Forty <clears> percent <throat> now believe in fortune-telling. Thirty-two percent believe in astrology. And a remarkable one-third believe in the power of lucky charms. Not the cereal, those little things that you wear on your neck or on bracelets. Thirty percent. So has superstition gone up or gone down? When worship decreases. We see that superstition goes up. In Bulgaria, 16% report attending a worship service in the last week. 60% now believe in fortune tellers. 53% believe in astro ast astrology. And a whopping 65% believe in the power of lucky charms. Iceland happens to be the most non-churched, unchurched nation in the world. Two to three percent of the population ever go to church. The most unchurched nation in the world. But they have a strong belief in huldefolk. Huldefolk are trolls, gnomes, fairies. So much so that when they're building a road, there are certain 
hills and mounds that they reroute the, the road around because the gnomes, fairies, trolls might live in those mounds and they don't want to disturb them. People get consultants to come in, fairy consultants, I guess, to tell them if they can build their homes on a particular piece of land so they don't disturb the fairies. When religion, when worship, when religious practice decreases, we have a rise in superstition. The amazing thing, in those countries where worship and worship attendance is on the increase, you see an increase in, in intellectual inquiry and a rise in science itself. Rodney Stark suggests that that rise is due to the fact that Christians believe in a God who created the world with order and reason. So now they're not afraid, Christians are not afraid to then study order and reason. They're not afraid to study science. It is really true what C.K. Chesterton said. When people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing, they believe in anything. Uh, so what do we do with Mary and Martha? Remember one of our members in the nursing home who lamented. She said when she was young, one Sunday morning, she was watching the birds outside. And when her father chastised her and said, hey, you, you're late, you need to get ready for church, she said, oh, Daddy, I wish I was like one of those birds and could just fly away. And she remembers her father saying, don't worry, there will come a day when you can't go to church and you will want to. And this member said, today is the day. I can't go to church, but I want to. See, there's a problem. The problem is making our faith about what we can do for God. And that's what it is, just what I can do for God. Instead, what Christianity is about, your faith is about what God has done for you and now what God wants to do with you and through you for others in the world. Who's directing the shots? It's Almighty God. God wants you to know what God has done for you. And then He wants to transform and change you so that He can work through you, with you and through you for others in the world. Professor uh, Dennis Oakholm put it this way. He paraphrased Karl Barth. The church is because Christ is. And then, again paraphrasing Barth, the great crater left by the impact of God's revealing world, the word, the church is the great crater left by the impact of God's revealing word, word. The word whose chief function is to come confront us with Jesus Christ. We're here to be confronted by Christ. So what do we make of this? Truly, we can do something for God when we're truly centered on God. 
centered on God and Christ. Mary was getting herself centered. Martha, her frantic activity, was all about, well, this is something I have to do. How do we find that balance? A good uh, illustration is a pastor in a community that's about half the size of Springfield. And when she heard about the five officers that were killed in Dallas, she immediately became very anxious. What can I do? What can my church do? Can we do anything? Should we do anything? So she decided to get a group together. Yeah, she couldn't do it right away because she had a funeral and a bunch of other stuff. So a couple of days later, she got together with her um, pastor, some pastoral support committee. That's the only group that she could get together. And they met in a restaurant in the afternoon. And they met around a cookie and coffee. They all had cookies and coffee. And then she remembers an 80-year-old member of the congregation came in late and sat down and she said, okay, what are we here to talk about? And everybody said, about the five policemen killed in Dallas. And this woman hadn't even heard the news. And the pastor says, well, she's a grandmother. She is a grandmother that's raising two grandchildren on her own. She's extremely busy. And the reason she came late to that gathering was she needed to drop off one of her grandchildren somewhere. She's extremely busy. And when we told her the story, she immediately said, oh, we need to go to the police station right now. And everybody said, what? And she said, we need to go to the police station right now and bring them some cookies. And that's exactly what they did. And the pastor's reflection on that was, this woman, even though she seems to be the busiest grandmother I know, this woman has the most restful presence at all times because she is so devout. She's in tune with God all the time. And it shouldn't surprise me, she said, that she immediately knew what to do. So there's a balance. It's not about what we can do for God. It's about knowing who we are before God and what God wants to do with us and through us for others and the world. Amen.
Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe. Rooted in Christ and rising to serve, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. You open the doors of your church, Lord, to all who feel distant or estranged. Give us courage to share your good news through conversation and love, and truly welcome all to worship, to the welcome of your presence. Lord, in your mercy. Cultivate in all people a care for the world you have made. Make us mindful of our impact on creation for the good of our neighbor and future generations. Lord, in your mercy. Reconcile and bring peace to communities that suffer. We especially think of Eureka, Kansas, having been hit with a tornado last week. Nice, France, still reeling from the terrorist truck attack. Turkey after the attempted coup and the Dallas Police Department. Raise up and strengthen leaders and organizations that promote dialogue, hospitality, and restoration. Lord, in your mercy. Protecting God, sustain police officers, firefighters, EMTs, and others who attend to public safety. Uphold those who are sick, injured, or who will die this day. We pray especially for Meredith Adams, Drew Bowman, Lael Biella, Carolyn Callan, Larry Carlson, Terry Carlson, Pam Cole, Lyle and Lucy Dolly, Sandy Drake, Jeff Dykeman, Jeff Hemphill, Mark Henson, David Jones, Alan Kamens, Tina Law, Ellen Lassant, Carol Lohmeyer, Chris Marquardt, Carolyn Nyes, Bob Starr, Bene- Rod Thurman, Luann Trask. Are there any others? We joyfully give thanks for all the grace present in our lives. We are especially thankful for our 26 young people and chaperones who returned from a great week at camp. Continue transforming them in Christ now that they are safely home. You are the God of our salvation. You have enabled us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Hold in your eternal light those who have died, especially Karen Stiltner and Benita Stamper. Lord, in your mercy. We lift our prayers to you, O God. Trust in your promise to hear us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. God of mercy and grace, the eyes of all wait upon you, and you open your hand in blessing. Fill us with good things at your table, that we may come to the help of all in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to who the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth, the Lord, the In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. All is ready. Our Lord invites us. Please come. You may be seated.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. O God, as a mother comforts her child, so you comfort your people, carrying us in your arms and satisfying us with this food and drink, the body and blood of Christ. Send us now as your disciples, announcing peace and proclaiming that the reign of God has come near, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And gracious God, our God of tender compassion. As you heal the sick and welcome the stranger, bless those who leave this assembly to share the gifts of this table with our brothers and sisters who are homebound. May they be sustained by the love and prayers of this community and by the bread of life that satisfies all hunger. Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now for a few announcements, you may have received this. The Senate sent out a, um, a request for help for the tornadoes in Eureka, Kansas. They, are, of course, are part of our Senate. And they're asking for things like, well, if you want to make a donation, you can simply make one to Messiah with Lutheran Disaster Response, or LDR, uh, in particular, Eureka uh, tornado in the memo line. But you see all the other things they need, construction tools, enclosed trailer, even volunteers. Well, on the flip side, some of you noticed that we had our youth leave in a van last week, and yes, it indeed is Messiah's church van, and there's a picture of it, and if you, for those of you who missed it in the spirit, there's an update. And someone asked me to announce, oh, 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 a potluck. Every fifth Sunday, we're going to have a potluck at Messiah. And the last Sunday in July is a fifth Sunday. That, I believe, is July 30th. So remember that. Come and we'll have a party. Receive this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
Guided by the gospel, we welcome all worship, make disciples, hunger for ministry, nurture youth, and offer resources for our ministries, offer healing care to all in need. Go in peace, remember the poor.